hooked onto my microphone here. Good morning, everybody. The last couple of times I preached, I was uh, old school. I had my paper notes with me and all that. And this morning, for, I'm being electronic. So, but I still have my paper notes over there, just in case. It was, uh, it was an interesting time. Uh, I was due to preach next week. And Pastor Herb called me last yesterday morning, and he could hardly talk. He was so ill. He asked me if, if I could switch. So I'm... I wasn't quite ready, but I was mostly ready, and I didn't have time to download my slides, so we did a triple, t- triple ch- take. I got paper ones, I got it on my wife's cell phone, I brought a memory stick for Alicia to put on the, th- and, and of course I've got my, my, uh, I, my wife's iPad here. So everything worked to the glory of God, everything's working. Alicia did a terrific job, she put the slides up for me, and uh, we'll see what, how it goes I still do have the backup in case there's any hiccups or anything like that. Um, I want to thank uh, Pastor Adam for his choice of music. It led right into it. He didn't even know what I was going to preach this morning. He led right into the message this morning, which is entitled, uh, Why Pray? So before we start, uh, let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this opportunity to come before you in your house and hear what you have to say to us. Lord, open our hearts to receive. Touch us in a mighty way. We give you thanks. We give you praise in the precious and holy name of Jesus. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Let's see if I can get this to work. Yes. Hallelujah. Um, It's kind of, I guess you might say that it's an odd title. Uh, Why pray? Christians are supposed to pray, right? I mean, that's kind of what we are. We're prayers. But, but, you know, it's, we live busy lives. Um, it's go, go, go pretty well all the time, whether you're working from home or whether you're working in an office or a place where you go to work. It's busy. Life is very busy. You know, almost every week, Kathy and I sit uh, on a Friday and say, you know, yes, just yesterday, it feels like it was Sunday. And here it's Friday already. You know, where did the week go? I mean, we're tired. We're not supposed to be doing anything. And yet the week, the time goes by, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, so in the busyness of all of that, when do we have time to pray? You know, uh, And we're supposed to be praying people. So let's take a look uh, at what scripture has to say. Our keynote scripture today is Hebrews 4, verses 14 to 16. If you uh, wouldn't mind reading it with me, Uh, We'll read it aloud, and then we'll uh, get into what God has to say for us. Starting at Hebrews 14. uh, Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has ascended into heaven, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold firmly to the faith we profess. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to emphasize with our weaknesses, empathize with our weaknesses, sorry, but we have one who has been tempted in every way, just as we are. You did it, he, uh, yet he did not sin. Let us then approach God's throne of grace with confidence so that he may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. When I read that, I, first of all, in verse 16, another, I read another translation, and instead of it says with confidence, the word there was boldly. And some of the songs this morning said we should go to the throne of grace boldly, believing. So I, I, I chose this translation, but I mean, another word, another a name for boldly is confidence. Go to the Lord in prayer um, with confidence, with no fear, no condemnation. We know that Jesus prayed. Jesus prayed a lot. And in Luke 11.1, 1, I'm sure we're all familiar with that passage, the apostles went to Jesus and said to him, teach us how to pray, Lord. But before they got to the teach us how to pray part, they had to have seen Jesus praying almost all the time. The, the, the culture of the time that the, that the apostles were around was... They didn't pray. 
Their only time of prayer was when they went to synagogue on Saturday. And I don't know, I'm not, I'm not a historian, so I don't know whether they were encouraged to pray when they were in synagogue or whether um, the rabbis and the leaders of the church prayed on their behalf. I don't know. But most of the time that the apostles were uh, in their profession, most of them were fishermen, their, their day was taken up with fishing. I mean, they went out in the morning, early in the morning, they threw their nets in the water, they caught fish or, or didn't catch fish, and they sold the fish in so they could have some kind of existence. So they were not terribly familiar with prayer. So they see Jesus, the Messiah, and he's praying. I mean, he's the Messiah, right? Who, who's he praying to? What's he doing? So I'm sure the question must have been, um, why are you praying, Lord? Who are you praying to? And of course, Jesus' answer was, I'm praying to God the Father. Well, why are you praying to God the Father? Well, for direction, for, you know, what does he, where does he want us to go in, my, in our ministry, and so on, and so on, and so on. And that led them to the part where this says, where they would ask the question, teach us how to pray. Prayer is communication. It's a form of communication. It's, um, and communication, of course, is two ways, right? You talk to someone and they answer, right? It's not communication if you talk to someone and they don't answer you. Early on in our marriage, my wife and I used to have a unique, com- we, we had diff- different kind of, of a communication. She would talk and I'd grunt. <laughs> and I thought that was communication. In my household, when I was growing up as a kid, my parents didn't, my father didn't even grunt. They just yelled at each other. So that, you know, another form of communication. So we, but this scripture says, especially in verse 16, okay, let us approach God's throne of grace with confidence. Jesus is there as our advocate. He went through everything that we've gone through in our lives and more. I mean, none of us have been crucified and died. He did that for us. So he's there for us. When I was growing up, my, fa- my father was a man of few words, like none. And uh, when I was a teenager, my parents were, as I said, my father and mother yelled at each other. My f- parents were going through a particularly difficult time and it was almost constant arguing and bickering and all sorts of things. And I had enough and I was really upset by it. So I went to my dad and I said, Dad, I, I really need to talk to you. And to my surprise, he said, sure. He'd never done that before. Sure. Where do you want to talk? I said, let's go for a walk. So we went for a walk. We, we walked for what seemed like hours. And I'm laying out my heart, and I'm crying, and I'm venting, and I'm doing all sorts of things. And my dad is grunting. And we get back to the house, and uh, he has the key in the lock, and he's opening the door and he looks at me and I'm here I'm expecting these words of wisdom, these pearls of wisdom to come, you know, to kind of explain what's been going on and that sort of stuff and hear his side of the story. And he looks at me and he says, well, do you feel better? And he walked in the house and that was the end of the conversation. That does not happen in our conversation with Jesus. That does not happen. We talk he answers. Now, he may not answer the way you want to hear it, but he answers, right? In 1 John 5, 14 and 15. Okay. There we go. This verse says that we have the confidence in approaching God that if we ask according to his will, he hears us. And if he know that he hears us, whatever we ask, we know that we have what we ask of him. That scripture tells us that he, God is there. He's listening. He hears us. He answers our prayers. But he, it's also an encouragement that, to bring our prayers to him. Bring our petitions. Tell him what's going on in our lives. Now somebody, some would say, well, he's God. He knows everything. Why would he want us to do that? He wants us to bring them freely. He wants us to bring them 
before his throne of grace. He wants us to rely on him for everything that we need. Just as, I mean, I, sometimes I think, you know, I envy Adam and Eve. Can you imagine living in a place like the Garden of Eden? Anything and everything you possibly could want. No winters, no extreme heat and cold, beautiful fauna and flora, animals all over the place. You, and, but the, the clincher is you get to walk and talk with God. And what do they do? They messed it up. But what a, what a, what a wonderful time that must have been in those, that time, however long that time is, Scripture doesn't say, that they had with God, a personal relationship, walking with God the Father and talking with him. Here, um, in 2019, um, the dummy that I am, I got involved in an internet scam. I didn't think it was a scam at the time, but it turned out to be. And there was a whole pile of legal issues and all sorts of things. And we were just about to go on our 50th wedding anniversary cruise. And we get hit with all this legal stuff. And we were beside ourselves. Do we go? Do we not go? Do we go? And uh, we prayed. And we prayed, and we prayed. Uh, we were, at the time, I was interim pastoring in a local church, and we would go to the church every day, and we would be on our faces before the Lord, praying that this would go away, would, would res resolve itself. We sought legal advice, and the lawyer said, it's really not a big deal right now. Go on your vacation. Um, you know, this was in July. I had already a court, court date appointed, so it was September. So you've got lots of time. Let the process do what the process does. Don't worry about it. Go away on vacation. I'm a worrier. I'm a terrible worrier. I don't sleep at night when I worry. I'm cranky. I'm mad at my wife every day. And uh, the Lord took away all that fear from us. We had a wonderful vacation. Never once did I think about the lawsuit that was going to possibly going to befall us when we got home. I mean, we were worried we were going to many countries. We were worried that we weren't going to be allowed in because there was something on the internet that said we were some kind of criminal or something like that. And we were never thought of it once in the, the month and a half we were away. Never thought of it once. We, but that's not the, the purpose of the story. When we got back, it was getting on to court date was early September and I hadn't heard back anything and I had no phone numbers for the police or, or for the government for the, the Attorney General of the province of Nova Scotia and all I had the only number I had was my lawyer and I was wondering whether I should contact my lawyer or not and I was sitting in McDonald's eating stuff I shouldn't eat and uh, phone rang and it was my lawyer and he said uh, Good news, the case is gone, it's disappeared. All the proof they had disappeared, just gone. So the Crown has dropped the case, they've sent you a letter, which I have, that says there's, there, never, there isn't a case, there's no judgment, there's nothing, absolutely nothing. Praise God. So I say that to say to you that God answers your prayer. He don't wants what's best for us. In Philippians 4, 6, and 7, and that's, this one is in the Amplified Bible. I thought it sounded, it, fe it just felt right to me in, in what the Lord is trying to tell us. It says, do not be anxious or worried about anything, but in everything, every circumstance and situation, for a prayer and petition with thanksgiving, continue to make your specific Requests known to God. When we pray, we need to be specific. And we need to be continuous. Praying one time for something, and then you don't get an answer, is not going to do it. If, you know, we need to be praying 
specifically? We found that out too. If you don't pray specifically, what you get, the answer you get is, may not be the answer you want, but you weren't specific enough to, to ask for what you want. But let's go back a little bit. Christians, like I said in the beginning, Christians are supposed to be prayers. That's what we do. That's what we are. People who, who know us or know about, think they know about Christians, we're praying, right? But unfortunately, Christians, and I'm, I'm generalizing, so please don't take offense, Christians don't pray. Or they pray, you know, they're the kind of gimme, gimme, gimme prayers, you know? They don't praise God. They don't thank God for the many blessings. Uh, they just, I want this, I want that, I want the other thing, and they pray. And usually when they pray that, they pray it one time, and then they get mad when God does, doesn't give them what they ask for, right? Um, but sometimes God doesn't give us what we ask for, even if you're a gimme, gimme, gimme prayer, because it's not good for you. If he gave you what you wanted, it would lead you into problems. I was up for a job in, in Edmonton. We lived in Ontario at the time. I wanted that job so badly. I prayed over it. Kathy prayed over it. My daughter prayed against it. But, you know, and I got offered the job, but it wasn't, everything wasn't there that I wanted. And I turned it down. And I was really bummed about it, that, they, that I turned it down. And I was kind of mad at God. Three months after, three months after that, the company went bankrupt. Had I taken the job, I'd have been in a brand new part of, the, of Canada, in a city I hardly would have known in three months. And what was I going to do? I didn't have a job. So God protected me from that. And that's what one of the things God does in prayer when he answers your prayer. He protects you from things you don't even know are out there. You don't even know. You can't even anticipate what the, the potential pitfalls might be. But God knows. And if we're consistent prayers, continuous prayers, God will answer our prayers. And he will protect us from these things. In Matthew 7.7, 7, It says, and this kind of sums it up, ask and it will be given to you, seek and you will find, knock and the door will be opened to you. In 1 Thessalonians 5, 16 to 18, it says, rejoice always, pray continually, give thanks in all circumstances for this is God's will for you in Christ Jesus. He's telling us, he's there for us. He will answer our prayers. Like I said before, not necessarily the way we want our prayers answered, but he will answer our prayers. But that begs the question, is the answer I'm getting an answer that's coming from God? Or is it an answer that I'm getting because this is what I want? And so I'm kind of putting my own answer in there? Or is this an answer that's coming from Satan to get me away from God? into, you know, turn my back on Christianity. These verses give us the answer to that question, right? God, if, if you're a prayer, and you're a continual prayer, the answer you get, as an answer to your prayer, is the answer from God. And it's what you should be doing. And if, but if you want to test God, and I'm not so sure I'm a believer in testing God. But if you want to test God, I mean, David tested God, right? There's many instances in the Bible where Christian people tested the Lord, make sure it was coming from the Lord. So if you want to do that, by all means, do it. But the answer is going to be the same. You're going to get the answer you're looking for. You're, you're, going, to get the, you're going to be assured that that answer that came from God is the answer to your prayers. So we need to be consistent prayers. We need to be seeking God in every instance, not from the very smallest, the tiniest, to the most, to the biggest. You know, it's funny. 
Um, I don't know how many people you know in your circle of friends or family that are uh, atheists or agnostics or, you know, have nothing good to say about God and Christianity and any chance they get, they just kind of try to tear you down. And they certainly, none of them are prayers because they don't believe that there's anybody to pray to, so they don't pray. But when they get that result of a test and the big C word is there, or they've lost their job and they've got debt up to their eyeballs and they don't have money coming in, where do they go? They go to God. Even if they're atheists, whatever they are, they turn their eyes to God and cry out to the Lord to help them. You know, when I was, uh, when I was a new Christian, I was working in a place I was manager of 150 people. I made known to everybody that I was a believer. And, you know, most of them, well, terrific, terrific, terrific. Some of them, poo, 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 you know, yeah, that's for you, it's not for me. And invariably, I get a knock on my door. Can I talk to you? Come in, sit down. And they would spill their hearts out to me, their disappointments, their fears. Could you pray for me? And they made it very clear from the beginning that they were not praying people. They didn't care about God. They didn't, they didn't live their lives according to God. They just were just against all of that stuff. And yet, when they had their most difficult time, they reached out to me so that I could pray on their behalf. What an odd situation for people to pray, to ask believers to pray for them. I hope I'm not boring you with stories of, of how God's worked in my life. But years ago, I wasn't the greatest husband in the world. I mean, my background was pretty sketchy as far as what a father and husband should be like. And Kathy, bless her, tried everything that she could think of in her own strength to help me to realize what I was not being like as a father and a husband. And it all failed. And in desperation, she turned to God. Now, she had gone to a conference, um, and they had said, if you want to move mountains, pray. God says he will move you. You say, you speak the words, the mountain, go from there to there, and he will move the mountain over there. So in desperation, she started praying. She didn't tell me she was praying, but she Yes, I ran out. I guess I ran out of juice. Anyhow, um, she started praying for me. And after a couple of months, she we were sitting around the kitchen table, and she revealed to me that she had been praying for me. And she recognized that God had been working in my life, and had been answering her prayers, and as as massaging me to become more like Him. Um, I'm not proud to tell you that story, by the way, but it's part of the growth of being a believer. So I'm telling you all of this to encourage you to be prayers, to realize, to know without, with certainty that your prayers are heard. God speaks to you. Some people think that speaking, God speaking to them is gone. It was for Old Testament time, New Testament time. It no longer exists. That's not the case. God speaks to his people. He answers your prayers. And we can be assured in these scriptures, and there's many more, that God, the answers you get when you pray are answers from God. If you are a consistent prayer. I'm going to read something. In doing my research for this message, I... Um, came across this, I don't know, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's part of a book. I don't know how many of you have heard of John Calvin. Uh, this, was, this piece was written in the 1500s. John Calvin, Martin Luther were the founding members, I guess is a word, of the Christian reform. When uh, Martin Luther is probably most known for this, he 
posted uh, a petition on the cathedral uh, door uh, explaining all the things he felt that the, the Catholic Church wasn't doing and should be doing better. And the Catholic Church, as they off, some off, quite often do, said, get lost, we don't want to talk to you. So they broke away from the Catholic Church and founded the Christian churches, the Pentecost, excuse me, Protestant churches that we know of today. This was written in the 1500s by John Calvin. And it's about prayer. And I think it's just so appropriate. And I will read it to you. And if you want copies of this, I have some hard copies of this as well. Now, this is in Old English, so it's a little different than what we're used to hearing. But nonetheless, let's give it a shot. Still, it is very important for us to call upon him. First, that that our hearts may be fired with a zealous and burning desire ever to seek, love, and serve him. While we become accustomed in every need to flee to him as to a sacred anchor. Secondly, that there may enter our hearts no desire and no wish at all of which we should be ashamed to make him a witness. While we learn to set all our wishes before his eyes and even to pour out our whole hearts. Thirdly, that we... Uh, that we will be prepared to receive his benefits, benefits with true gratitude of heart and thanksgiving. Benefits that our prayers remind us come from his hand. And this is a book called Institutes of Christian Religion. It's uh, book three, and it's chapter 20. Uh, I, I couldn't have said it any better. Everything we, everything we want to know about praying and the benefits of praying is said in this particular in this particular passage here. Uh, Adam, if you'd come, please. So far this month, we've been talking about prayer and, the, and answers to prayer. We get answers to prayer when we're consistent prayers and when we're part of the family of God. I was born into the Kozakant family. I didn't have a choice in the matter. I, my parents got together and they made a baby and I'm born into that family. Good, for good or bad, that's who I am. And the same can be said to all of those here. You're born into a family. You don't have any choice in the matter. You're born into that family. We are not born into the family of God. We, we choose to become part of the family of God. It's a conscious choice that we have to make. What I'm leading up to is I'm sensing that there are people here that are I don't know the right the I don't want to insult anybody. I don't want to, I don't know what exactly the right word is, but are thinking about giving their heart to Jesus. This is the time to do that. Jesus wants us all to be part of his family. It's time to get off the fence and make that commitment. We've seen in all of the different messages this month so far that the benefits of being part of the family of God. You have an earth, you have a heavenly father that loves you, that wants to hear from you, that answers your prayers. We have a, a, a brother in Jesus who died on the cross for us to save us, sent by God the Father. We don't have to do anything. It's all done for us. Jesus did that for us. God the Father set this up, sent him to do this on our behalf. To encourage us to become part of the family of God. And when Jesus left us, he sent the Holy Spirit to be there for us. To be the liaison between us and God. To be there as a reminder that Jesus Christ walked this earth for us. And, and it was there and died for our sins. What more do you need? What more can, you, can anybody say? 
We live in a cruel world. We don't know what can happen even today after we leave the services. We don't know. Our health may go, may deteriorate quickly. I'm sure we all know of people who were diagnosed with cancer and within a couple of days they were gone. Where's, where is your soul going to go? If you don't know Jesus, where is your soul going? Where's it going to go? Is it just going to float around in the atmosphere or be buried in the ground with you? Being part of the family of God assures us that we, when we die, are going to be walking the streets of gold in heaven with Jesus. What a reward for doing nothing. The only thing we have to do is ask, admit we're sinners and ask Jesus to come into our hearts and live in, inside us. That's it. There's no fees, there's no initiation, there's no anything crazy. It's simply that. And then you're assured of a place in heaven and you are part of the family of God. What a gift we get from God. So I encourage you, both people here in the sanctuary and those on the internet, if this is your time, don't waste it. Get on your, get on your knees and pray to God and ask him to come into your hearts. Change your life forever. God will bless you. And when we give our hearts to Jesus, angels will rejoice in heaven. If you were a believer at one time, and for whatever reason, you were disappointed by in, in men that were supposed to be in leadership of your church or whatever it may be, and you've turned your heart away from Jesus. And the Lord is speaking to you today. Come back to the family of God. Nothing, nothing, nothing any of us could have done and not, will not be forgiven by God. God will forgive everything. There's nothing, nothing we could have done that would prevent God from welcoming us into the family of God when we ask. So I implore you, please, if this is your time, speak to God. Ask Jesus into your hearts. He will bless. He will bless you and your life will never be the same again. And if you don't like your new life, we'll give you back your old one. No problem. Thank you very much. Adam?